Let's step back for uh, this session and take a look at three of the pedagogic variables uh, we have so far done. We've dealt with selection, sequencing and pacing in terms of uh, pedagogy. And what I'd like to do now is, is talk about ways in which they hang together and produce a certain specific set of possibilities, just like we did earlier with the three curriculum variables. Now, uh, it's crucial in terms of the logic of educational analysis that you start to understand what the different possibilities are within education. Possibilities that break you out of uh, existing in a in a two world mindset where there's this teacher centered kind of education where everything is controlled and then a learner centered kind of education where everything is kind of open and the key feature of educational analysis is breaking you out into a world where you can see the wonderful possibilities that exist in education uh, which are far more diverse and far more open far more creative and far more beautiful than just those two forms so let's take a look at uh, the pedagogic variables and let's start off uh, with the first uh, pedagogic variable which was selection and let's call it a variable and by a variable, I mean uh, something that has the possibility of different states within it. Now, in terms of selection, we're going to define this very tightly. We're going to say that there's only two possible states. It could be open or it could be solid. Now, uh, in terms of solid, we have a situation where only one choice is available. Uh, in terms of open, we have a situation where a whole bunch of possibilities are open in terms of what's selected. Now, the art of educational analysis is when you move into a situation where you're now working with two variables, not one. Notice what I've done is I've added sequencing now onto selection, and now we have to start to think, think of what the possibilities are. You have four imaginary spaces which are produced in a situation where you have the two variables, selection and sequencing, and two states, open and solid. Read it from the bottom upwards, start off with selection. If it's open, you then move on to sequencing, which could be open or solid. If it's selection, being solid, then you have a situation where sequencing could be open or solid. Let's now add uh, a third variable into the story. And this time around, we've got selection, we've got sequencing, and now we've added pacing on as the third variable. Notice that we've kept the states the same. We are always only working with open and solid states. And what this means is that we land up in each uh, variable with a, a kind of a binary choice between open and solid. Now, it's a very simplified analytical strategy, but it does help us to see quite clearly what some of the possibilities are. Notice again that you're in a situation where you now have eight uh, imaginary spaces or eight possibility spaces and you read it from the bottom upwards starting with selection choosing whether it is open or solid and then depending on that choice moving on to sequencing working out whether it's open or solid and depending on the choice working on to pacing which can be open or solid now that produces a situation in you work where you're working with uh, eight different uh, possibilities and here is only one of them in this particular one, you have selection solid, you have sequencing solid, and you have pacing solid. Here is a second possibility. You have selection solid, you have sequencing solid, but the pacing in this case is open. And you can see what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say to you, try and imagine what it's like to have a situation where you're working with uh, more than just open or closed uh, possibilities for all the variables together. Now, the logic of this actually works with a very simple uh, mathematical um, logic, and that deals basically with an exponential logic. And let me just show it to you quickly. Uh, as you go through the book and as you go through the videos, you're going to find that we're really working with five pedagogic variables. We're working with selection of knowledge, sequencing of knowledge, pacing of knowledge, assessment of knowledge, and the relationship between teachers and students. And in all cases, one part of the book is going to say, just analyze uh, those pedagogic variables in terms of them either being in an open state where lots of options are allowed, or a solid state, where you have a very definite um, uh, situation. 
where only one possibility is actually allowed. Now, the 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, or 2 to the power of 5 at the bottom there, is going to try and catch the logic in mathematical terms. The 2 represents the states, open or solid. The 5 uh, represents how many variables you're working with. Now, in this case, you're working with five variables, two states. And all you do is you multiply uh, the states each time by the number of variables. So you land up in a situation where you have 32 possibility spaces, or 2 to the power of 5 possibility spaces. Uh, but of course, we showed earlier that when we were working with curriculum variables, the relationship between everyday and specialized uh, knowledge, the relationship between specializations and the relationship inside specializations, we still only had two states, open and solid. But we were working with three variables. So you have two, uh, the base number, which represents the number of states, and then you have three, which are the number of variables. So you have two to the power of three, two times two times two. You have eight possibility spaces. Now, of course, uh, in terms of the book itself, we actually working in total with eight educational variables. Okay, we're working with three curriculum variables and five pedagogy variables. And that gives us a situation where we're working with a base of two. They're all either open or solid in terms of their states, uh, but we're working with eight variables. So you have a full set of 256 possibility spaces. Now, this can on, on the one level seem quite daunting. But I find it incredibly exciting because it starts to give you a picture of the enormous variety that exists within education across the world. Uh, and this is what education uh, studies or educational analysis should do for you. It should open you out to the wonderful sets of possibilities that are out there in a formal uh, but productive way. So let's take uh, the three pedagogic variables, pacing sequencing and selection um, and let's work with them in and and see what are the beautiful sets of possibilities that they actually allow and let's start off with uh, a situation where you have selection solid sequencing solid and pacing solid now this is that classic teacher-centered model uh, it's very definitely exists in south africa uh, we call it the chorus model and that's a situation where the teacher stands in front, the teacher knows what she's doing, and then she sets the rhythm. She goes, one plus one is, and the kids go, two. And so that rhythm goes on, with the teacher being very much in control of the selection, the sequence, and the pacing, and there really only being one set of options allowed. Now, direct instruction works in a very similar way, uh, except it's a far more powerful and sophisticated form of, of pedagogy. And what direct instruction does is make sure that in a pre-programmed selection way, every single move is determined and worked out as a good and efficient and worthwhile move. And then those are sequenced in a specific way that works, that's tested, that's known to not produce mistakes or fallacies in logical reasoning or misunderstandings, and that it is paced very specifically to work so that by the end of the lesson you've got the whole thing done. It's an astonishingly powerful model of pedagogy, but it is also very uh, strongly uh, coded. Now, what about a situation where you actually open out selection? You, you, you have a situation where a numerous number of possibilities are allowed in terms of what can be selected. But then once you select, the sequence is clear and the pacing is set. Now, I've put a MOOC here, uh, and this is kind of, kind of what this course is. It's kind of like a MOOC in some ways, uh, although I don't know how massive it's going to be. But a MOOC is a massive open online course. And what you have in that situation often is you... Uh, allowed to choose from a whole smorgasbord of courses that you want to do but once you choose the course the sequence is then set it's done in a very uh, preset sequence of videos and often what they also do is they pace it in a determined way in other words uh, you have to do the course week by week by week and after the course they actually take the course off the net you can't do it 
until it starts again, for example, in the next year. So the macro pacing of it is uh, very solid. And as a minor technical term, I'll, I'll talk about this later, the micro pacing of a MOOC, your actual choice when you in the situation yourself sitting on the computer is radically open. Uh, it's in a situation where you can decide to do it at 12 o'clock at night or at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, uh, here we have a situation where you've, and this is the third possibility, you have selection actually open, you have sequence solid, but then you allow the pacing to be open. And hopefully what this is starting to do is, and hopefully your, ima your educational imaginations are start starting to go, mm, what could this be? How could this work? Can I think of an example like that? Uh, and my own particular example is of a PhD cohort system where a number of uh, doctoral students all work together uh, over a, a long period of doing their PhDs and they've got complete control over, well, quite a lot of control over what their selection of their PhD is going to be. You pretty much can work that out yourself. But in a PhD cohort model, uh, certainly the one at my university, UKZN, the sequence is very distinctly set. You have to have your proposal done by a certain time, you have to have your literature review done by a certain time, you have to have your theoretical framework done, and they work it step by step by step in a very ordered sequence. But because the, uh, the, f the complexity of the PhD itself, what happens is the pacing is very open and you land up in a situation uh, where you're allowed to pretty much complete the sequence, the determined sequence, in your own time. Now, this particular uh, pedagogic possibility space is, I find, astonishing. And I, I hope you can hear the excitement uh, in my voice as I talk about this, because uh, I find it fascinating that these three simple pedagogic variables, selection, sequencing, and pacing, with simply only two states, open and solid, can produce this wonderful variety of pedagogic possibilities. And in this particular one, you have a situation where you allow the selection to be radically open, the sequence to be open, but then you tighten the pacing and you only have one forced pace. Now, a wonderful example of this is, is gesture drawing. Uh, and that's a situation where uh, kids get together in a class or they could be adults learning to draw and the teacher says to them, choose anything to draw and then draw it in any way that you want. And they have to kind of go for it uh, uh, as quickly as they can. But the pacing, as I've just indicated, is very, very strong. You're only given, for example, two minutes to draw and, and the teacher counts it down. So it's the pacing which drives the lesson. And then after the two or three minutes, the teacher suddenly says, stop. And she says, look for something else to draw. You can choose whatever you want. You start to draw it. You can draw it however you want. But you know you've only got two minutes to draw it again. So the pacing is very solid. It's a wonderfully exciting uh, pedagogic style. Now, this uh, uh, fifth possibility uh, is a situation where selection, sequencing, and pacing are all open. And we know this very well from open project work where the learners are given a number of possibilities about what they can select to do. They can do it in whichever way that they want and they can also pace it in their own time with only a very general end time point given as to when it's actually going to have to be handed in. And this is a wonderful form of pedagogy for developing self-control in the learner and self-motivation where the student has to learn how to self-regulate their own learning in order to make sure that they get the task done. It's a very powerful form of pedagogy and it's a celebrated one, but it is only one of eight uh, other wonderful possibilities that exist. And so we could go on, a chasing, for example, a situation where the selection is determined and very precise, but the sequencing and the pacing is open. And you can try and guess whether my uh, example, the Khan Academy, or you can work out whether my Khan Academy example is a good one. I'm not convinced that it's actually a, a good example. This one I'm far more convinced about. Uh, it's a situation where selection is solid uh, and pacing is solid, but the sequencing is left open. And this is done in Japan where they determine exactly what it is that's going to be taught in a science lesson and they give a very strong pacing. You've got only a limited amount of time to do it. But then they say to you, you work it out. 
It's your sequence. You try to work out the different possible sequences and it creates an amazingly productive uh, lesson space. As does this one, where you're very specific about selection and you're very tight about the sequence, but you allow time for meaning making and sense making to occur so that the people, the students, actually understand it from the ground up. And this is a particular kind of pedagogy which the Bernstinians feel works very well for working class students. But the question should arise, well, sure this one works well for working class students, but there's another seven types which in different situations and different contexts also work very well for different people with different subjects at different times in different places. And that's the point of pedagogic uh, analysis in this specific instance where you have to know what the possible varieties are because it enables you to actually work more flexibly when it comes to this wonderful world of uh, pedagogy and education which we all exist within.